Welcome to Jazz Zone Together, our new online jazz community where we will provide jazz education and classroom resources, interviews with jazz educators, artists, and celebrities, along with valuable tips and repertoire suggestions. Today, we welcome one of the most highly respected names in the music world, John Hassey. John served for 33 years at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, where he curated music exhibitions. He also founded the Smithsonian Jazz Orchestra and drove the creation of Jazz Appreciation Month. He is author of numerous books on jazz and has contributed many important articles on the importance of jazz. Now I'll turn the mic over to Dick Dunscombe to conduct the interview with John. Dick, take it away. Thank you so much, Bob. And John Hassey, welcome, man. <laughs> Thanks, Dick. It's just great to see you and to see Bob, and I'm honored that you've asked me to do this. Listen, this is one of the most important ones that we'll ever do. You, you represent so much in jazz and jazz history, and we really want to share it and, uh, and get it out in the, the realm that we cover. So anyway, it's a pleasure to welcome you today. And let's get started with how you began in music. You know, Dick, music must be in my DMA, DNA because my mother told me later that when I was just a toddler standing in my crib, if she put music on the radio or the record player, I'd sway back and forth. I'd hold on to the railing and sway back and forth. And um, we didn't have much money, but there was enough money for my three older sisters to take piano lessons. And I'd fall asleep at night listening to them play Mozart and, and Beethoven. And, and uh, when I was five, I started picking out Christmas songs by ear on our, on our old upright piano and um, started piano lessons in second grade and um, got bit by the jazz bug when I was in junior high, started a jazz trio and then joined a college band playing blues. <laughs> and uh, it was, um, I think by the time I graduated from high school, it was uh, deeply embedded, the love of the music and, and a growing curiosity to learn more about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that followed then your uh, formal education. Uh, tell us about that. Well, in college, I went to Carleton College, which is near the Twin Cities of Minnesota. Um, I was bitten by, or driven by two passions, politics and music. I formed a jazz trio and had the honor of studying jazz piano with two top pianists in New York City, Jackie Byard and Sir Roland Hanna. And during my college years, I had the opportunity, uh, the thrill of meeting some of my jazz heroes, Thelonious Monk, uh, Bill Evans, uh, Billy Taylor, and others. Uh, after college, I worked for uh, two years. I worked in presidential politics in Minnesota, running a campaign. Mm -hmm. And then I decided I wanted to go on to graduate school. So I chose Indiana University at the time, the world's largest school of music and a leading place for the study of ethnomusicology. Uh, and I went there especially to be able to study with David Baker, yeah. who became a mentor and a dear, dear friend, as well as a neighbor. I took every course I could from him um, and just learned so much. He was, he was the most amazing, infectious, and passionate teacher I think I've ever had pleasure of studying under and he, he deeply influenced me and um, to this day I, I thank my lucky stars that I knew him and learned from him and grew to love him very much. Um, so during this time I did field work in the black churches of Gary, Indiana, uh, produced a documentary video called Gospel and Gary, started doing lecture concerts of ragtime, boogie and, and blues, jazz piano. Um, started writing for national publications such as the Journal of Jazz Studies. Um, 
and played my way through graduate school 600 nights at a colonial themed tavern. Uh, <laughs> it, was a, it was a really good um, education because I was able to study with top people in the field of jazz, music history, ethnomusicology, folklore, African music, and uh, phonograph archiving. It was um, a, kind of a hybrid, but I'm, I'm just grateful for all I learned in Indiana. Uh, great institution and a great place to come from. That's for yeah. sure. And so, then I was just going to say, if while I was there, I started uh, becoming interested in the musical history that was all around me, baked into the soil. Turned out that H uh, Hoagie Carmichael was born in Bloomington, went to Indiana University. And so I got interested in his music. And um, there was a lot of ragtime that came from Indiana. It was a center that hardly anybody recognized as a center. So um, I did a lot of work on those and produced a couple of uh, record albums and, and a doctoral dissertation. And that was uh, just uh, a, an enriching experience. So the next logical question seems to be then what led you to your role as curator and historian? Well, after I finished my PhD, I was, as I finished my PhD, I was hoping to become a college professor, but I couldn't seem to get a job and um, not wanting to be unemployed, <laughs> I applied to the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania for a crash number training in business. They mm -hmm. took 30 um, recent PhDs and all but PhDs in the humanities and social sciences and gave us all day training in uh, statistics, microeconomics, macroeconomics, management, finance, and career development and marketing. And uh, 30 corporations came to recruit us. And I landed a job with Procter & Gamble uh, at its headquarters in Cincinnati doing marketing management on head and shoulders shampoo and conditioner. <laughs> it was uh, a steep learning curve, like about this, this steep. And I learned a lot, but um, in my second year, I realized this just wasn't right for me. I was a square pig in a round hole. And so I left that and um, got a couple of grants, played in the piano bar, scuffled for a couple of years. And then I heard about this opening at the Smithsonian. It said, curator, 19th and 20th century folk and popular traditions. And it was in the division of musical instruments. And I thought, I don't. I don't know anything about musical instruments. I mean, I had a piano and a player piano, but you know, I wasn't an expert on the instruments. So I called the head of the search committee and we talked for a while. She said, you should apply. So I applied and um, I guess there were about 50 others and they, they brought three of us in to meet the staff and meet the director and give a little talk. and. Um, I guess I fooled them. <laughs> <laughs> they offered me the job and I, I fooled them for 33 years. <laughs> it was, uh, but it was, it was really the um, opportunity and um, the opportunity of a lifetime in a dream position for me because it applied just about everything I'd ever done, whether it was working in the archives at Indiana or um, producing records or, you know, marketing a candidate, uh, writing uh, proposals and scholarly documents and collecting. I was a inveterate record collector and sheet music collector. So I was able to kind of channel all that into my job. And um, Nick, I'm just, I'm, I'm as grateful as anybody could be for the opportunity to do that work for, for a lot of time. It was, um, I'm thankful beyond all words. Well, I speak to you on behalf of all of the music people in the world, and we are so thankful that you took that job. And if you did fool them, you're not fooling us, man, because you've given it straight to us. Now, as a part of your Smithsonian role, and on behalf of the State Department, you've traveled and lectured all around the globe, sharing the influence of American music to the world. Share with us, if you will, what you believe the impact of that aspect of your work has been? Well, in the overall story of US cultural diplomacy, my contributions were um, really like a few grains of sand on a beach. 
But I did feel so honored and thankful to represent our country's music in Europe, uh, the Middle East and Africa um, and Asia as well. And I was elated at the opportunity to engage people across the boundaries of nationality and language to shine a spotlight on some of America's proudest artistic contributions. Uh, each time I felt it moving to engage people across uh, all these different boundaries to enhance understanding and to build friendships. Um, I was thrilled to play my tiny little part to bridge cultural differences. And um, among the high points was addressing a group of uh, boys, most of them orphan teenagers, who had ridden an hour and a half in a bus come from their one room shanties that had no paved floor, no running water, come hear me give a talk on Louis Armstrong. And when I played a recording of him singing, Hello Dolly, most of the boys started singing along. Mm. I was gobsmacked. Here I was halfway around the world, um, boys whose native language was not English, uh, 14 and 15 year olds, and they knew the words to Hello Dolly, which just told me that how powerful Louis Armstrong still is, uh, especially in Africa. Um, I lectured on him in Kenya and in Zambia. And in both cases, uh, there were some young musicians in the audience and they came up to me and one of them said, you changed my life forever. Mm -hmm. And the other one said, life will never be the same again. And I took that to me, not that I had done it, but Louis Armstrong had done it through his music and his inspiration and example. And I was, I was just the vessel that, that brought, brought him to them. Um, and something that really surprised me is what the U.S. cultural attaché, Ellen Beanstock in Nairobi, Kenya, wrote to her superiors in Washington. She said, Armstrong's story of making it as a black man in America, not very friendly to black Americans, struck a chord in the audience. The story underscored the complexity of racism in America, but the telling of it by a compassionate, admiring white man made many start to think about their understanding or misunderstanding of racism in America today. And I told her assistant, a Kenyan, that I thought my skin color would be a handicap. And he said, no, it's an asset because here is a, a white dude, you know, who's clearly so admiring of Armstrong and, and other great musicians like him. Um, just extolling his virtues and, and, and sharing his music. And um, so that was, that was one of the um, remarkable events that happened to be uh, doing my tiny little bit for cultural diplomacy. That's a huge little bit, John. You know, I, I and, and many others believe that without Louis Armstrong, we would have never had what we have today called jazz. And I didn't have a chance to meet Louis, but I did meet his secretary, Phoebe Jacobs. And she was so wonderful and shared so many stories about him. And I think, I think we all are trying to tell the younger jazz educators, that's the place to start. Start with Louis. Here he so we also want to talk a little bit about the Smithsonian Jazz Orchestra. We know you established that. Share with us some of your memorable moments in the development of that ensemble. Well, uh, thank you, Dick. It was, um, we were able to found it with a earmark from Congress. That's in Washington speak, that's a set amount of money that is, um, appropriated for a very specific purpose. Um, it might be a, a bridge in, um, across a big river in, in Mississippi, or in this case, it was enough money to establish a Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra. Uh, we had our first concert season in 1991. And so the orchestra is now celebrating its 30th anniversary. Initially, we invited David Baker to be the maestro. And he being very um, respectful of his elders, 
said, well, he would do it if we also invited Gunther Schuller to be musical co-director. Uh, so we did, and for two years, they split the conducting duties. But after two years, um, it, it, it became evident that you really, you need to have a single musical and artistic director. So um, David became that sole musical and artistic director. In 1992, we played at the White House Jazz Festival uh, that President, um, President Bill Clinton had as a, as a big deal because the, the only other one was one that Jimmy Carter had on the South Lawn of the White House. Mm -hmm. uh, 1993 was a great night. I believe it was October 15th at the Apollo Theater in Harlem. Mm -hmm. We went in and played an entire program of Duke Ellington's music in the neighborhood where he lived most of his life. It happened to be the same day that a great big uh, traveling exhibit that I curated called Beyond Category, the musical genius of Duke Ellington opened in New York City, at the Museum of the City of New York, and that my biography of Ellington, Beyond Category, was published. So it was, a, it was one of the most exciting days in my life. And David, mm -hmm. David was just the best possible person to conduct the band. As, as you know, I'm sure, uh, Dick, that he always, he never just conducted the orchestra. He would share with the audience anecdotes, information about the conductor and the piece. And um, it was uh, it was a very informative and uh, entertaining um, uh, evening. Two other uh, highlights were in 1999, Duke Ellington Centennial, we took the band into Washington National Cathedral on Ellington's 100th birthday. Here was the nation's jazz band at the National Cathedral, a couple miles from where he was born and raised, playing the greatest, some of the greatest music of Duke Ellington. Um, and it was so powerfully moving that um, even though I was in the second row, I couldn't see much of the concert because the tears were rolling down my face. I was so moved by his music this great orchestra, uh, a terrific young tap dancer, Noble Potts, and the beautifully voiced, beautiful faced um, Morgan State University choir. It was, wow. And one final highlight was in 2008, with the cooperation of the State Department, we took the orchestra to Egypt to play in Cairo and Alexandria. The opening concert was right in front of the Sphinx and the Pyramids, mm -hmm. you know, which are ancient, ancient um, symbols of antiquity and uh, Egyptian heritage. And here was this, this multiracial jazz band come across the ocean from the United States to play some of the best music of American jazz composers. And um, it was, everybody was thrilled, just David Baker and all the musicians in the audience were just blown away. Fantastic, man. Well, you also established the Jazz Appreciation Month. Talk to us about that. This is how Jazz Appreciation Month came about. In the mid and late 90s, I was increasingly concerned that jazz didn't have the audience it should, that it didn't have the respect and understanding that it should. I took inspiration from Black History Month, which was established in Washington in 1926 as Negro History Week by Carter Woodson of the um, Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. For 50 years, it was just a week. And in 1976, they renamed it and made it a month. And then it really took off. And uh, I thought, you know, let, let, let's have a national month for jazz. And um, looking at the variable months, I thought, it needs to be during the school year. You can't have this during the summer. And May is too late because some schools are already out uh, in May. You need to have it um, late in the school year so all so school bands can rehearse all year and play at their best. It has to be educationally focused. So I proposed April. Um, it took a couple of years to get support, but then in 2001, um, Bill, Ivy, who was then the chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, decided 
to give it a discretionary chairman's grant. And then my colleagues at the Smithsonian took it seriously because it suddenly had a little bit of money, you know, mm -hmm. and it was, it was real. Um, so I started lining up partners, the State Department, U.S. Department of Education, the Voice of America, NEA, NEH, and um, mm -hmm. jazz educators, et cetera. And uh, Quincy Jones helped us make the announcement in July of 2001 that this was going to be happening. And in April 2002 was the very first Jazz Appreciation Month. Branford Marsalis came and literally helped unveil, took a cloth off a battered cornet we had acquired, but not um, announced yet, that we believe Louis Armstrong was taught to play on. Mm. And the Jazz Appreciation Month is really about creating a focus for public awareness, a hook for the media, and a platform for nationwide celebration. And it's actually spread around the world. It's being celebrated now in all 50 states and 40 some countries around the world. And you know, teachers, schools, libraries, museums, radio stations, um, all sorts of uh, organizations have gotten involved in it. And to this day, the uh, Smithsonian has distributed over 2 million posters free of charge to schools, music educators, uh, professional mm -hmm. musicians and the like. And um, I, my dream is that as the years go by, more and more um, people in the jazz community and outside the jazz community will see the value of this and get on board. It doesn't cost them anything to, to celebrate. They can, they're a nonprofit. They can put the jazz appreciation label on anything they're doing, mm -hmm. and they don't need permission from anybody. They just go ahead and do it. Congratulations, John. That's a most important step that you took, and it is indeed recognized around the world as a very significant thing. We might also want to mention at this time for the people that aren't that familiar with the history, uh, that groundbreaking announcement from Congress about jazz being a national treasure. I know both you and I were somewhat involved with that with John Conyers. Yes. Uh... That was uh, House Concurrent Res Resolution 57. And uh, it was one of the best things that Congressman Conyers did for jazz of the many things he did. And I, uh, the two people who wrote that are dear friends of mine, um, working for him and with him. And it was John Conyers who um, made the push to get the funding to start the jazz orchestra. And so uh, I will be forever indebted. The Smithsonian will be forever indebted to him for doing that. Um, a few years before that, in 1988, another member of the Congressional Black Caucus, Representative Lewis Stokes of uh, Cleveland was instrumental in securing funding, another congressional earmark funding for the Smithsonian to acquire the vast archives of Duke Ellington. They had been sitting in an unheated, unair conditioned warehouse in Manhattan. Mildew was setting in on some of the tape recordings and the music was just a mess. And we were really worried that if it didn't get into proper hands, uh, more deterioration would take place. And uh, Sotheby's and Christie's were <laughs> sniffing around uh, eager to get their hands on it and auction it off in dribs and rabs. So instead of being all together, it would be some of it go, would go here, some would go there, maybe to Japan, to Germany, all around the world, doing a huge disservice to musicians, uh, educators, and scholars for, for all time because it would never again be reunited. So it was a very big deal when that um, we were able to acquire that collection and it came to the Museum of American History in April of 1988. And really, I, I think uh, um, it's been one of the important factors in um, Ellington's the continuing rise of his star over those um, 30 some years. Because musicians from all over the world, uh, Wynton Marcellus, Esperanza Spaulding, uh, you know, David Berger, people from all over the world, scholars, 
journalists like Billy Taylor have all come to use it. And um, people have written their dissertations on it, master's theses. It's, it's the Ellington collection, uh, the number one collection in the world with 100,000 pages of mm -hmm. unpublished music that Ellington wrote for his band, Ellington and Billy Straylin, another 100,000 pages of documents. Can you imagine Dick, getting your hands on 100,000 pages of unpublished music by Brahms or Gershwin? Oh, man. That's the thrill we felt when that, when that collection, oh, yes. National Treasure, came to the museum. What a life you have had so far. You know, with, with your expertise and the consummate knowledge that you've accumulated all the, all, through all of your years, I have a, a little bit of a different kind of question to ask you. And that is, if you were to name two jazz musicians that would be the most impactful of all, who would they be? They would be Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington. Louis Armstrong, I like to say by example, taught other musicians five S's, how to sing, sing, scat, solo, and stamp their material with their own musical personality and identity. He also um, moved upward the playable range of the trumpet for not just jazz trumpeters, but all trumpeters. But I think just about every soloist in any kind of American music since the rise of Armstrong has been influenced by him, even if they don't realize it. They've been influenced directly or indirectly because he, he, he was a stunning innovator and a stunning exemplar of some of the best things about African-American and American culture. So influential. Uh, Duke Ellington was the uh, most important composer, orchestrator, and arranger in the history of jazz. And I'd like to say that he ranks as the greatest all around American musician in history. By that I mean composer, orchestrator, arranger, band leader, conductor, a soloist, accompanist, and musical thinker. I can't think of anybody who did all those things as brilliantly as Ellington. And one of the uh, great things that Ellington did was to find musicians who had distinct individual sounds, bring them into his orchestra, figure out very quickly what was the best, uh, the, the best of each musician, what they did the worst, and then write from a way, write for them in a way that brought out the best in each musician, like a magisterial chef. He, um, he took all these ingredients and made them into a whole uh, greater than the sum of its parts. It's, it's such an inspiring story. Amen. Amen. Okay. Among your uh, writings, you've created a number of books, articles that have related to the recording of history and the development and significance of jazz in the world. Can you give us a brief synopsis of some of those works? Sure, um, and thank you for asking. Uh, the first book was a book on ragtime with uh, contributions from uh, 15 or 20 different scholars. Gunther Schuller was one of them, called Ragtime, It's History, Composers, and Music. Uh, the next book was a biography of Duke Ellington, uh, Beyond Category. The Life and Genius of Duke Ellington, uh, to which I was so honored when Wynton Marcellus wrote a wonderful foreword in three verse. And um, uh, the last biography of Ellington, 1988, had been kind of a hatchet job. Uh, one way I called it voodoo musicology. <laughs> he, the author said that after World War II, Ellington didn't compose much of value. They mostly wrote music to get girls and that he didn't uh, leave much in the way of written music. All were wrong, wrong, wrong. So I thought somebody needs to give Ellington his due and uh, spent several years digging into a story in the archives and was pleased to present what I think is a much 
more understanding and appreciative and uh, accurate the picture of his life and music. Um, I had the uh, distinct pleasure of uh, editing a book um, called Jazz, the First Century, which, which had uh, a couple dozen authors, each writing in their own area of expertise, and um, 300 illustrations and dozens and dozens of sidebars. And then 10 years later, that was made into a college textbook called Discover Jazz, with writers from the United States, uh, Europe, uh, four or five countries, again, uh, each person writing in his or her own area, own area of expertise. And it was the first textbook to have a whole chapter on Latin jazz and a whole chapter on world jazz. Um, and let's see, I produced or co-produced uh, three record albums, one on Hoagie Carmichael's music, one on Ragtime from Indiana, and then the Smithsonian Jazz Anthology. Jazz, the Smithsonian Anthology. I was co-producer and co-author of that, which is kind of like a history of jazz in a box. It, it replaced the old uh, Smithsonian collection of jazz, the classic jazz, which had been out of print for over 10 years. And educators were calling the Smithsonian and saying, well, please bring it back, because they had based their history of jazz courses around it. So we came up with a, a new way of looking at it and expanded the, the canon, if you will, to include more women, to include Latin jazz, to include jazz from other countries, including South Africa, and um, to bring the story more up to date. Um, so that was a that was about a ten year project with a with a team. It really took a village to put that together, and I was uh, grateful to be part of that team. You mentioned earlier a little bit about your lectures. And I know that you've written and lectured on the importance of music and in particular jazz on our culture. How important is this in the evolution of culture? Gosh, I think um, jazz is a critical element of American culture uh, and much more important than most people realize or recognize. Uh, jazz has influenced how Americans speak, dance, dress, make art, make music. It's influenced our fiction, our poetry, our, our visual art, our, our language and our slang and our very ways of moving and regarding ourselves. It is, it is um, if we hadn't had jazz, uh, I think our culture uh, would be quite different than it is. And, um, I wish more people really got how this invention that came out of, you know, um, came out of uh, the undercats, you know, the underdogs, <laughs> undercats, <laughs> uh, and uh, came up from the streets of New Orleans and the back alleys and yes, the brothels. And uh, now in a hundred years has gone on to become this this music of, of world proportions and the highest artistic aspirations. I wish more people got that, Dick. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's something I think we all should aspire to uh, help make happen. Well, you certainly are doing that. And now, John, that you've retired from the Smithsonian, what are your plans for the future? Well, you know, uh, when I stepped down uh, several years ago, I said I was not retiring, I was rewiring. I <laughs> <laughs> get to rewirement. By that, I meant um, kind of rewiring my brain to focus on different things instead of building the collections and doing exhibitions and things like that. I would focus instead on <clears throat> sharing my passion through uh, lecturing and writing. And that's been, uh, that's been, what I've been doing and what I am doing, uh, it's, it's always a kick to, um, to share something you're passionate about with an audience. And, you know, I give talks uh, either live or uh, virtually on Duke Ellington, Ella Fitzgerald, Ray Charles, Frank Sinatra. But what surprised me is the 
invitations over the years to talk to non-musical groups, something I never expected uh, to talk to 600 doctors at the Cleveland Clinic or 3,000 ordinary people at the Chautauqua Institution in New York. Um, what these talks are about are, well, three different topics. One is why we need the arts more than ever, collaborate creatively to make beautiful music together, where I use music examples to show people how, how they can better collaborate. And finally, leadership lessons from the jazz masters, where I look at the lessons that can be discerned from the careers and music of Duke Ellington, Miles Davis, et cetera, to help anybody in a position of leadership. Um, lessons like listen closely, find your own sound, take risks, play in the moment, and things like that, that, um, that, that really uh, the best of jazz musicians have something to teach us about. Um, and then I'm, I'm writing. Um, mostly these days for the Wall Street Journal, about once a month they commissioned me to write on a jazz musician or a, a masterpiece. And uh, it's also surprising to me that because I never expected to write for businessmen and uh, stockbrokers and investors, people like that. But it feels to me like a kind of musical missionary work. Uh, taking this music that we are so passionate about and explaining it to people who might not know who uh, Errol Garner is or Billy Strayhorn, might never have heard of Billy Holiday's Strange Fruit. Explain it to them in a way that one hopes they get interested enough to go listen to the music, find it on iTunes or on YouTube or someplace and check it out. And if they do, then these pieces of musical missionary work will have served uh, a rewarding purpose. John, this has been an honor to do this interview today. I know that we could go another couple of hours and, and still have lots more to say. You, you are uh, such an icon in the world of jazz and music. Uh, this interview should be required viewing by all. You've long been a hero of mine and to many others as well. Your work is so appreciated and your impact has been priceless. Thank you again, my friend, John. Thank you, my friend, Dick, and thank you, my friend, Bob. I'm so honored that you asked me to do this and I wish you nothing but the very, very best. John, thank you so much for your time and your contribution. To our viewers, thank you for watching and for being a part of Jazz Zone together. We hope you enjoyed the interview and found it of real value.